So at this point, I'm going to let uh, Rich Butler, our, our Christy Minstrels for the evening, uh, introduce his family, and then I will uh, introduce the songs that we're, we're going to do, and then we're going to have uh, group participation uh, at the end of the program. One day I was walking through Salem with a couple of my children a few years ago. We went into Al Cormier and I said, kids, without him you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> He, he said later, that didn't sound quite right. No. <laughs> <laughs> what I meant was, Al was the principal at the school who hired me 25 years ago. If I hadn't been hired then, I wouldn't have met my wife, Tammy, and we wouldn't be here today. So, because of Al, the kids are here today. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Al for inviting us to sing. This is my fam. I'm Rich Butler, Tammy Butler, my wife, Stephen, my son, and Rebecca, my daughter. Okay, I told, uh, I told Richie I'd do the cliff notes here. The first song we're going to do, uh, the first group, is a group of uh, Southern songs. This one was written in, actually it was written in 1859, <clears throat> and then was adopted in 1861, and it was a very popular song uh, by both sides, really, but the Southerners picked up on it first, and then the Northerners picked up on it as sort of a, uh, a satirical way to uh, annoy the, the southern troops. It's called I Wish I Was in Dixie, and it's attributed to Daniel Decatur Emmett. And it was, this was sung by the Bryant minstrels and the Christie minstrels uh, at that time. And basically the song portrayed a free black slave a yearning to return to the plantation of his birth. And it was adopted by the Confederate soldiers as their unofficial anthem. I wish I was in the land of cotton, old times there and not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland, in Dixieland where I was born in early on one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Then I wish I was in Dixie, hooray, hooray, in Dixieland I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie. In 1861, a song by James Ryder Randall called Maryland, My Maryland uh, was written. Actually, uh, James Ryder Randall uh, was a Southerner. He believed in the Confederacy, but he was from Maryland. He wrote the song with the intention of trying to get the people of Maryland to switch sides, but it didn't happen. It didn't work. Uh, but it became the Confederate battle hymn, and they, they were, it was sort of a a nasty song in the, in the sense of because some of its lyrics call President Lincoln a tyrant, a despot, a vandal, and the Union was northern scum. <laughs> so you, you get the feel that he didn't like the North. <laughs> Thou wilt not cower in the dust, Maryland, my Maryland, thy gleaming sword shall never Maryland, my Maryland, remember Carol's sacred trust, remember Howard's warlike thrust, and all that slumbers with the just, Maryland, my Maryland. One of the interesting things about some of these songs that were written is that uh, if the northern people, uh, soldiers, liked them, they would change the words. And the south would do the same thing, using the same melody. Uh, and we, we do that today to a certain extent. The last uh, southern song uh, is written in 1861 by Harry McCarthy and Ann Chambers Ketchum. It refers to the unofficial Confederate flag, the Bonnie Blue. Well, obviously, there's a little Scottish influence here by Henry McCarthy. Uh, interesting note was that in the lyrics, you hear the term band of brothers. And I think we're all familiar with that term because that term has been used today in contemporary times, movies, 
uh, books, Band of Brothers, uh, taken from a speech that was made by Henry V in Shakespeare's Henry V. So the Bonnie Blue Flag. We are a band of brothers, and native to the soil. Fighting for the property we gain by our destroyer. And when our rights were threatened, the cry rose near and far. Hurrah for the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah, for southern rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. Many of these songs were considered to be marching songs. When you are on a long trek, obviously, uh, it's tedious. And even today, if you ever go to a, a military camp and you see uh, manual of arms being taught and marching being taught, there will be some sort of cadence, either a song or uh, uh, some other kind of cadence, because it, it takes your mind off the fact that you've got a 25-mile hike <laughs> you know, in front of you. And this was typical then. I mean, how else did these armies move around? They marched. The south, the south had trains, but they were in poor shape, and they didn't have standard tracks the way the north had. But all the battles were fought in the south, so it's really, really a difficult uh, situation just to do all that slogging, as some of the, the letters we read today, you know, slogging through swamps and rivers and, and a whole lot of muck. In the north, in 1862, uh, George Root, who, by the way, wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs, from what I could find out, wrote a song called The Battle Cry of Freedom. It was used as a war <coughs> rally song and a recruiting song to raise the 300,000 soldiers that uh, President Lincoln had called for in 1862. It became so popular <coughs> that uh, it was used as the theme song for the Lincoln-Johnson election ticket in 1864. About 700,000 copies of this song were sold. Yes, we'll rally round the flag, boys, we'll rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. We will rally from the hillside, we'll gather from the plain, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The Union forever, hurrah, boys, hurrah, down with the traitor, up with the star, while we rally around the flag, boys, rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The next song uh, that they're going to do is called Tramp, 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 uh, called the Prisoner's Song. It was written by George Root, and basically, uh, the song was probably sung by soldiers marching also, but it was also sung by soldiers who were in prison camps. As you know, Andersonville was the southern prison camp, and uh, the northern prison camp, if I remember correctly, was in uh, Utica. In Elmira. Elmira. I'm sorry, Elmira. In Elmira. Uh, the last place anybody wanted to be was, was in a prison camp. But basically, the, uh, the lyrics will tell you the sentiment. Of, of the prisoners at that time. In the prison cell I sit, thinking, Mother dear of you, and our bright and happy home so far away. And the tears that fill my eyes, spite of all that I can do, though I try to cheer my comrades and be gay. Tramp, 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 the boys are marching. Cheer up, comrades, they will come. And beneath the starry flag, we shall breathe the air again of the free land in our own beloved home. Yeah, I don't think I mentioned uh, in my talk about the 123rd what their battle flag was. Uh, every, every regiment had a battle flag. And flags were one way to signal that, hey, I'm on your side. And uh, the 123rd battle flag was a red star on a field of blue. And uh, they, the battle flag was a very important flag. If you ever watched uh, Red Badge of Courage, anybody read the story and seen the movie? The, uh, the flag that is carried 
uh, the, the person carrying it falls, and somebody comes along and picks it up because that's that's an important symbol. An important that means if that flag is still flying, that there's life, you know, in that in that regiment. So the battle flag was a very important item at that time. Now we're near the end of the war in 1865, and a special song was written by Henry Clay Work in honor of Sherman's March to the Sea, marching through Georgia. And if you're familiar at all with the march through Georgia and the scorched earth policy, um, the tone of this song doesn't quite go with what actually happened. <laughs> Bring the good old bugle, boys will sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will start the world along. Sing it as we used to sing it, 50,000 strong. While we were marching through Georgia, hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that makes you free. So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea. While we were marching through Georgia. I wanted to add a little something to what Al said about caps with uh, the person who went out and dragged the, the person back and it was a, his son. There was a song written with that story called um, Just Break the News to Mother. It's one of those sad, heartbreaking songs of the Civil War. Um, just wanted to mention that. You and you you I'm not prepared to sing it to him. <laughs> it's a great song. He knows it though. Also, um, <laughs> to, to speak about music for a second, he mentioned snipers and he mentioned buglers and drummers. but. He didn't mention that the buglers and drummers had a very dangerous occupation because since they were the means of communication, the snipers often aimed right at the musician. <laughs> that's right. That's why it was a dangerous shoot. job. Shoot the drummer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the by word. The, uh, the next song we're going to hear is Aura Lee, and actually uh, was written by George Poulton and uh, W. W. Fosdick, but it was sung by both sides. Uh, we always have unique situations that take place. And in the Civil War, like, not like other wars, they, things like this would happen in World War I, and World War II. As I said, the Union had regimental bands, the Confederates had regimental bands. And one night, the Union band struck up some music. And they weren't far from the lines of the Confederacy. And so the Confederate band struck up the music. So they ended up having a battle of the bands, <laughs> so to speak and uh, went back and forth until uh, finally, uh, you know, it got so dark they couldn't see anymore. But it was certainly a diversion from, you know, the daily killing that probably took place on that, on that day. But uh, this, this particular song, orally, both sides loved it. Uh, Elvis Presley loved it. That's what made him famous years later. Again, we talk about the, the um, composers of that time, and especially Stephen Foster. Uh, his music is still used today and it's incorporated into many, many songs. As a leopard in the spring, neath the willow tree, sad and bright I heard him sing, sing of Orali. Orali, Orali, Participation. Uh, I do want to point something out to you. If, if you are really interested in learning more about the Civil War, uh, and specifically about Salem in this county, uh, I do have some <coughs> sheets here for you with the resources that I used for the talk, and I'll just read them off, give you an idea of what's out here. Uh, the first book was a book written by Henry Morehouse of, of Greenwich called Reminiscences of the 123rd. Another one was written by of Bryce Bull, uh, Soldiering, the Civil War Diary of Bryce C. Bull. Uh, the latest one was Marching to Save a Nation, written by Jeffrey Jones, who was a local uh, writer. Very good. Another one that's unpublished, 
Uh, Plowshares into Swords uh, was pulled together by Christian Heidorf, and uh, uh, the primary materials for that are at the public library. They, they, they are restricted, uh, but you can look at them. The library will let you look at them. But those are the original letters of uh, Robert Cruikshank, Lieutenant Robert Cruikshank. Other sources are a county history book, very good. Uh, the uh, New York Monuments Commission called New York at Gettysburg is uh, an another book. Uh, if you want a full story about David Allen Russell and his career, a book written by uh, A.D. Slade called That Sterling Soldier, that's available in our library and you can, I believe, still buy it on, on the internet. Uh, a book that came out two years ago about the Ross brothers who lived in Eagleville, uh, written by Reed Ross called Lincoln's Veteran Volunteers Win the War. Basically what he's talking about is the fact that so many of these men would enlist, their three months would be up or their year would be up and then they would re-enlist again. And the reason they did that was because their religious beliefs were so strong and the anti-slavery beliefs were so strong they wanted to see uh, that particular way of life to end. Southerners didn't see it that way, of course. For them, it was economics, because without slaves, their economy was shot. The book, uh, a good book. If you're interested in music, written by uh, Bill Austin, uh, who was head of the uh, music department at Cornell for many years, called Susanna, Jeannie, and the Old Folks at Home. But it's a terrific, uh, book telling you all about Stephen Foster's music, but not only his music, but the music of all the other composers during that period of time leading into the Civil War. So you get a, a good idea of the sentiment that was taking place at that time. And I do have a few copies of these. If you want one afterwards, just see. Now, our sing-along. You have at your seats the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And the uh, Richard family will lead us. For this song, we're going to have the youngest butler join. That's the only attempt to move our single on those seats. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. our program for this evening. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you will continue to search out Civil War history because for our area it's really a very interesting period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. has a question. I thought you were going to have questions. Okay, yes, certainly. Well, Are there some any of these questions? people. <laughs> 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 these have questions, right? <laughs> I'm wondering about the, uh, the letters. Once the, the men on the battlefield wrote the letters, how long did it take before they would get here to sail? Probably a month or two. Probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. And would that be by train? Probably. Yes, I would think so. And then, um, where were the weapons made? <laughs> okay, the question is, where, where were the weapons made? Uh, Springfield Armory, of course. Which, uh, like this, the Spencer, I believe, was a British rifle. 
Uh, no, not the Spencer. The Spencer was made in New York. The Spencer made in New York. Okay, and the Winchester, of course, was a repeating rifle, along with the Spencer. Which, well, Winchesters were New Haven. Yeah, right, which came later. Uh, so the southern side, as I said, used some of the British weapons because that's we weren't going to give them any, so, so they had to get those from some other source. I imagine tramping through the swamps, their weapons would be not working when they got over to where they were going to use them. Well, probably, but if those of us who are in the Army know that we were cleaning our weapons every, all the time. <laughs> every time, all the time. <laughs> other questions? Oh, well, Dallas, that, that, that was not Dallas, Texas. Okay. That was Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, all our, all, the Salem group was basically uh, from Washington, D.C., going south down to the coast and even as far as the Florida. Well, didn't they refer to the Tennessee campaign role as the yes. western region? Yeah. Well, yeah. It was, was the western region. Right. It was more than the coastal region, but, right. but it's not Texas. Yeah, it's not yeah. Texas, New yeah. Mexico. Arizona yeah. Some yeah, and they uh, they mustered out in New York City in July, and then they returned home on ch by train on uh, no, it was not July. It was in in June, and on July first they arrived here in in Salem. H Company did. The other companies got off, you know, at their designated spots. But it was a big celebration when they came home. Yes. Do you know where the rest of our company G is located now? The Ross, no, I don't. Uh, in in the Morehouse book, of course, there is a list of all those people on the on that roster. But I have not seen the roster G uh, form like, like that one. We have the company G in Hartford. You have the G. Same design, company E. Yeah. You have company E. Is that the only one you have? Yes. In Hartford, yeah, they are scarce. Okay, well again, I, I thank you for coming and feel free to stay and visit and to look at any of the exhibits uh, that you have or I do have some of these sources here if you want to look at them, I'd be happy to show them to you. So. Thank you.